And I'm going to hand over to Pat now to come and preach to us. Thanks, Pat. Thank you, Adam. Thank you for your welcome. It's so lovely to be with you. Congratulations, Fernwood Church, on yesterday. Wow, that was really lovely. All those that worked so hard in the preparing of it and worked so hard outside. I hope some of those folks I saw working really hard out there aren't going to sleep through the sermon this morning. <laughs> but seriously, it was really lovely to see, wasn't it, the way you connected with the, with the community. And I understand you're coming up for your fifth anniversary which is really lovely to look back and see the way God has blessed you and added to your numbers. And that's happened last for the last five years. Think about the next five years. Isn't that going to be wonderful? I mean, you've got a Sunday school that uh, you haven't got room for them to meet and folks here. So anyway, the Lord bless you. It's been really lovely to see the way God has led you. Uh, the connection here is that Mandy is our daughter. We've been around uh, here in NEC for a, a few years since Carl and Mandy came into the area. But it's really love, lovely to see you. Well done uh, for yesterday. I was looking around just uh, a little while ago, and it's lovely not to see a clock around. <laughs> uh, preachers always love not seeing clocks. It's beautiful. Last Sunday, I was preaching at a, ch at a, a church that meets in a village hall, and since I was there last, they changed it around. So in fact, there was a clock behind me, which is not a good thing. But seriously, it's just lovely to share with you. Let's pray. Loving Father, I just pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts might be acceptable to you, our God. Amen. Amen. Which one do I press here to go forward? The big one. The big one, thank you. <laughs> Wow, that's a good start, isn't it? Extravagant uh, devotion. After Jesus, uh, uh, after Lazarus, rather, had been raised from the dead by Jesus, uh, and knowing that the chief priests uh, were plotting um, his death, Jesus returns to Bethany, which was just a, a couple of miles from uh, Jerusalem. It's six days, as we read before the Passover, and Jesus knew that just in a few days, he would face the agony there and the challenge of Gethsemane. He knew uh, that he would be going to the cross with its shame and uh, all its suffering. But now was a time to be with friends. Now, this is not just some uh, normal evening meal that these were fo folks were having. The Bible tells us specifically a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Now, I wonder why, well, you don't have to imagine too much as to why that was so. Jesus has just raised Lazarus uh, from the dead. Wow, what a lovely thing to do, to invite Jesus into the home and have a meal as a term, in terms of thanksgiving for all that had uh, happened. If we add the number of people up, uh, the, the story is told in two other um, Gospels, we find there was at least 17 people. Now, that's a big number, isn't it, for, for houses in those days <laughs> there? Uh, and that included the disciples as well. And it's interesting, you see, if you see Martha. Now, Martha, now Martha was the disciples. They were inquisitive people, weren't they? They were also people that never fully appreciated what, what Jesus was doing half the time until he explained it. And you can imagine them saying, the disciples saying to Lazarus, did it hurt? Was there a tingle? Was there a bright light? Did time pass by? Were you aware of this? Did you go to heaven? What was it like when you woke up again? And it's interesting, we just take those three characters as a, almost a, a sideline here, and we see that we have a, a, a little micro, microcosm of, the, of our Christian life. We have working for God we have worshipping God, we have witnessing for God. So that's just a little uh, analysis there of the people who were around there. Mary ministers in this particular story to Jesus, and this is almost unique. In the scriptures, you don't often find people ministering to Jesus, do you? 
you find Jesus ministering to others. He's counselling Nicodemus. He's counselling the rich young ruler. He's feeding 5,000 people here and 4,000 people there. He's raising somebody from the dead in this place and in another place. He's healing people in lots of ways. He's always ministering to others. But here we have nearly a unique occasion when somebody is ministering in a very effective way, in a very real way, and a real meaning way uh, to, to Jesus. The disciples weren't very good at this themselves. Remember, they had a unique opportunity of ministering to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they missed it. They missed it. So we read in Mark 14, they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to the disciples, sit here while I pray, stay here and keep watch. But he returned to the disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not watch for one hour? So when the disciples had a really unique opportunity to minister to Jesus, they missed it. But not Mary, not Mary. Here she takes the opportunity uh, to, uh, uh, to minister uh, to Jesus. We, we see here Mary's extravagant gift. Somebody has said, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Just let that sink in because it underlines really a lot of what we're saying. You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. If you love someone, uh, your heart is full of generosity towards them, isn't it? You want to do all you can for them. You want to show and express uh, your, your love here. But uh, Mary's extravagant gift here, but extravagant devotion is costly. Mary's anointing Jesus with uh, this perfume was very costly in three ways. And first of all, it was costly financially. Now, I, I'm treasurer at church there, so I quite like this sort of subject here and reminding people there, but uh, it's not the only thing I've got to say this morning, really. It really isn't. Uh, costs, uh, 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 this uh, devotion that Mary showed and that we should show as well can be costly in this way. It can be costly financially. And for us, doesn't it? Is Jesus more important to me than things? Is Jesus more important to me than things there. Yeah. It's interesting when we look at this gift that she brings, this spikenard or this uh, nard, and the Bible never, uh, um, the words we find in the Bible are always significant. In this particular section of the Bible, we read that the, uh, uh, the spikenard was pure nard. Now, this is actually interesting because the person who wrote this down would have known that very occasionally, or perhaps not so very occasionally, uh, when it was manufactured, put together there, there would be imp imperfections in it. It would be, as we would say today, watered down. Uh, but here the Bible reminds us that this is pure nard. It's the real thing. It's as costly as it could possibly be. And uh, the size of it, if you think of a, a can of Coke or something like that, that's probably the sort of uh, uh, amount that we're talking about here that she gives over. It's evidently uh, produced uh, from a plant in India growing in the Himalayas. So if you can think of the way it would take time to get from one place to another in the olden days, you can realize how part of this cost there, because it was very, 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 very costly. Uh, it's often mentioned the price of it in contemporary writings of the time. This was a very expensive perfume. The ancients, they just loved to use it at their special uh, times when they all gathered in the baths, the water baths and at, uh, at uh, banquets. Even Judas mentions, as we read in the story, it's, wor it's worth a, a whole year's wages. It's this very expensive stuff. We don't know, the Bible doesn't tell us where Mary got this from at all. It might have been an heirloom. It might have been passed down uh, through, the, through the generations there. We just don't know. It might have been kept as a, a dowry. We just do not know. What we do know was that this was a very expensive perfume that Mary was going to give away in devotion uh, to Jesus, uh, to, to her love for Jesus. Mary's actions were extravagantly costly. 
Uh, it's an act uh, that demonstrate the importance of utilising our own as we worship God in various different ways, different ways. Whether those uh, sort of resources are material possessions, whether it's the skills, the gifts that God has given to us, uh, whether it's the time that we've got to pass on in service to God and others. She used this valuable perfume, which she could have kept for herself. She could have sold and uh, made a lot of money, but she doesn't. She takes the best she has to use as an expression of her devotion and her love uh, for uh, Jesus. And it's a challenge to us that we encourage, we should be encouraged to consider how it is that we can use what we have of our own resources that, first of all, God has given to us anyway in order to benefit and to bring blessing into the lives of others and also to bring glory uh, to God. Uh, Paul writing to Timothy reminds us, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin uh, and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Mary was prepared to give the best she actually has. And Jesus accepts this worship that Mary gave him because she rightly saw that he was worthy of all that she could give him and even more. A magnificent God demands extravagant devotion. Isaac Watts in these very well-known hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, puts it like this, I think, in the last verse. Were the whole realm of nature mine that were an offering far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Wonder is uh, our devotion to God, the way we express it, the way we work for him, uh, does it cost us financially? I, went, I, had to, I saw this quote in a, um, one of the commentators and they said this, if others looked at how you spend your money, would they conclude that you must love Jesus a lot? I thought that was rather good. If other people looked at us and sort of understood how we were using our money and our resources, would it actually click uh, to them that we love Jesus a lot? Mary's act uh, of love ex was extravagance was spontaneous generosity. She couldn't hold herself back, for God loves a cheerful giver. We give uh, with the right attitude. We also need to be aware that we must give the best. That they cut corners by... We give with the right attitude. We give the best... Uh, and also we give our all. And of course from the scriptures, a classic example of that comes to mind, doesn't it, when we think of the offering of the widow that Jesus noticed. Jesus observed a poor widow who contri contributed two small copper coins as her offering uh, to the temple treasury. Though her offering was small in monetary term value, Jesus commended her because she gave of her property and gave everything she had. Our giving should be with the right attitude. Our giving should be giving the best that we have uh, to God and giving uh, our all. Uh, John Piper says this, The best way that I know how to capture the spirit of New Testament generosity is simply to say the issue is not how much must I give, but... How much dare I keep? It's a challenge to us, isn't it? Challenge is not how much shall I give, but yet sinners, Christ died for us. Think about it. You can't get better generosity than love like that. So we try to give as God uh, gives to us. Secondly, it can cost us socially. And the challenge there is, is Jesus more important to me than my pride? Mary was willing to, to humble herself in order to honour Jesus. It's impossible.
for us to honour God and at the same time maintain a sense of our own self-importance. The two don't go together uh, at all. Like John the Baptist who saw Jesus coming and said, he must increase and I must decrease in uh, such a way uh, that uh, it was uh, in itself humbling. Just think of it, to pour a precious perfume on somebody else's feet is one thing. To wipe it with your hair is yet another. Respectable Jewish women never let their hair down in public there. One commentator noted uh, that since a woman's hair is her glory, she was laying her glory at uh, the feet of Jesus. She was giving up her pride. She had without, without respect for what others thought, and she was worshipping Jesus, honouring him in humility. Matthew and Mark, in their accounts of the Gospels, they mentioned that... Uh, the uh, f uh, head of Je the feet of Jesus and the head of Jesus uh, were being uh, uh, you were covered with the ointment. Matthew and Mark, coming from their particular perspective of kingship, talks about the head being anointed, and John talks about the feet being anointed. And there's uh, no contradiction in this at all. Uh, the gospel writers were coming from different aspects, from what they were thinking about how God was working. Mary was so caught up with her devotion to Jesus, she didn't stop to consider what others might think about. Uh, she would cast public opinion to the wind and let her hair down uh, as she wiped Jesus' feet. Uh, what matters is what Jesus thinks about your devotion to him, not what other people uh, think there. So extravagant devotion can be costly, financial, costly, and socially it can be uh, costly to us. But thirdly, it attracts uh, criticism. Is Jesus more important uh, to me than my reputation? Just note the contrast of two characters in the story that we read from the Bible here. And it's uh, a contrast of true and false discipleship, if you like. You've got Mary with this extravagant expression of love and of devotion. And on the other hand, you've got this cold, calculating criticism of Judas. Mary gives her all. Judas, just a day or two later, would be the one who would tr be trying to get the best he can for himself as he received those 30 pieces of silver uh, as he betrayed uh, Jesus. Judas uh, speaks up with this unbelievable disregard for what was happening in his midst there as he saw uh, Mary do this. One of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He had no idea of what was happening uh, as in terms of Mary's heart for expressing her love for Jesus. He had no idea when Jesus was accepting what she was doing. Um, Mary worshipped despite the criticism. She is there to worship Jesus and she doesn't let anyone's criticism get in her way. Mary's action, as we saw and see in this story, is unconventional, is unexpected. It went against societal norms and traditions. She disregarded potential criticism and judgment to show her love and her devotion openly. And this teaches us that our expression of faith and uh, devotion may not always uh, conform to other people's expectations. But genuine acts of love and worship should not be hindered by external opinions. I wonder whether sometimes you thought to do something to express your love in something to do for others or whatever, and you thought, I wonder what somebody else would think, and things like that. It can get in the way. It can get in the way. But Mary worshipped uh, despite the, critis uh, the criticism. 
In the 1950s, uh, some of you are my contemporary, well, one or two of you are my contemporaries as well, but others of you might have heard the story. In the, in the, the 1950s, uh, when Jim Elliott set his sights on going to the unreached tribes of Ecuador, uh, he spoke, of course, to his Christian, his Christian parents, and they t started to dissuade him. Uh, well, Jim, they said, don't you think your uh, gifts will be better used here, he was in America, uh, in serving the young people in our church. His Christian parents were saying that, but he was convinced that God wanted him to go to Ecuador. He went with four other missionaries, and you can read the story, it's, it's sometimes under the heading mid-century martyrs there, uh, but this group using an MAF plane landed in a, 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 a particular clearing they tried to make, uh, contact with these people had never been contacted before and the, the end of the story was that they all were all killed they were all killed the sequel to that was that uh, later on others were able to reach just shortly after reach this tribe and the tribe came to Jesus where he put the criticism aside and he went and that was the result and a tribe was blessed a tribe was blessed uh, because of that Mary did not need to listen to the criticism of Judas or any other person when she had the commendation of the Saviour. Then, yeah, you know, I think this is just is a lovely ending to the story, really, because I think it's very, very, uh, very, very significant. Mary's gift of her best became a blessing to others. Right? The important thing for Mary was what she did, but in doing it, in doing it, see how people were blessed. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfumes. All those other 17 in there were blessed uh, as a result of her devotion uh, to, to Jesus. Perhaps people passing by with the open windows actually all could smell the lovely perfume there. They were blessed. Heartfelt worship of King Jesus will always spill out to, to others. One way or another, the extravagant, heartfelt, sack display of affection was for Jesus. But everybody else got blessed, including Judas. He couldn't avoid, could he, smelling that lovely perfume. Mary's gift of her best became a blessing for others. And in Matthew's account of it, we have the words there, I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So not only did those people in that room years ago get blessed because of the perfume and the smell of it and all the rest of it there, today we're blessed, aren't we, in actually remembering her and what she did, and it will go on and on like that. We're just drawing things uh, perhaps to a conclusion. Overall, uh, Mary's action in John 12 serves as a powerful, a powerful example of devotion, of sacrifice, of reverence, and it prompts us to reflect on our own relationship with God and challenges us to follow her example, her selfless example of love and worship. And uh, perhaps two questions as we end. First of all, what do we do? Uh, what do we do? What, sorry, why do we do what we do for the Lord? Why do we do? What is our motivation for serving God? And I think we need to challenge this sometimes in our own lives. Is it because we are satisfied that we're doing good or something like that? It, it can be that way. Uh, we learn from Mary's have time to give, others have talents to give, others. Uh, have uh, various skills that they can give and yet others have the opportunity because they can do nothing else to pray in order to see the kingdom of God um, move forward. Canon Archie Coates uh, recently succeeded Nicky Gumbel, you know Nicky Gumbel of, uh, of uh, fame there with the, um, I'm just wondering what it is now. <laughs> Alpha course, that's it, Alpha course. Uh, he, he retired, although he's not completely gone into to retire, he retired as the vicar at Holy Tr Trinity Bapt, uh, Brompton. And uh, the uh, successor, uh, Archie Coates, I was hearing the other day, he refers to the church as a blessing machine. 
He refers to the church as a blessing. Now, that's not saying everything about the church, but it's saying a very powerful thing about the church, a blessing machine. We as a fellowship here together are a blessing machine. Uh, and if you like, at the highest level, well, what are we called to do? To go into all the world and to preach the gospel, to encourage folk to receive the greatest blessing possible, the forgiveness of sins, a relationship with God, and uh, the promise of eternal life. A blessing machine saying to those who don't know Jesus, he loves you and he wants you to love him back in return. And if you like, at the other end of the spectrum, we're reminded of the words uh, of Jesus in Matthew 25. Um, the king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you do for the least of these among you, uh, my brothers and sisters, you do it all for me. A blessing machine proclaiming the gospel. A blessing machine getting alongside those people that need our help in one way or another. I finish not with a quote from the Bible, but from John Piper, but it brings together, I believe, what I've been trying to share with you this morning. But John Piper said this, it is a beautiful thing when the worth of Jesus and the love of his followers match, when the value of his perfections and the intensity of our affections correspond. Uh, well, I've got, I should have put that up there for you. You could read it. There we are. You can read it now. It is a beautiful thing when the worth of Jesus and the love of his followers match, when the value of his perfections and the intensity of our affections correspond. And I think that sums up, really, what I've been trying uh, to talk about this morning in terms of extravagant devotion. Jesus is worthy of our worship and all that we can give, and we need to actually uh, do that. We need to give that. So, what does extravagant devotion mean for me, well, I've said enough, so I'm just going to leave that with you to go on thinking there. But I hope the final hymn will help you. I haven't sung this hymn for a long time. It's an oldie, but hearing you earlier on, I know some of you will know it there. Take my life. And as we go through it, it deals with everything. Take my 